Hello, Calculus Kids. Welcome back to another lesson in Calculus. This is Mr. Bean, and in today's lesson, we're going to talk about how to connect f, f prime and f double prime. Is how, what's going on with the function and its derivatives. Now, it seems like that's what we just did in our last lesson, but last lesson was focused in on just the graphs, and we're going to remind you of a few things that we've already done, and then what we're going to do in today's lesson is basically everything we've been doing for this whole unit five. So to start us off, I've got this function. We're gonna take a table of values for f prime and f double prime and organize it to help us tell us what's going on about this function f. So go ahead and take the first derivative, take the second derivative, set them equal to zero and solve them. Like let's find those critical points, the possible points of inflection. Go ahead and do that now and uh, pause the video so you don't see the answer appear until after you've done it yourself. So you should have come up with a negative one third and a negative one for the first derivative. And then for the second derivative, x equals negative two thirds would be our possible point of inflection. So let's now make a quick sign chart of all of this stuff. So again, go ahead and remember that it's negative one. So we're gonna start off from negative infinity to negative one, uh, and then we'll have negative one and then negative one to negative one third. So go ahead and do this for both the first derivative and for the second derivative and make your sign charts with the positives, the zeros, the negatives, those types of things. Go ahead and pause and finish this off. So here's the sign chart that you should have been able to come up with. Hopefully you got that correct. And you can see then we could draw some conclusions about what's going on with this function because we know that here the graph is increasing then decreasing, then increasing. Therefore, we have a maximum at x equals negative one, a minimum at x equals negative one third. Here we know it's concave down, so it's concave down on that interval, concave up on this interval, so we have a point of inflection at x equals negative two thirds. So we, could, we have a lot of things we could use to draw conclusions about. But sometimes you'll have a question, like your next question on here, that asks, when is f both concave up and decreasing? So when does that happen? Well, concave up and decreasing is going to happen where? Let's look at this. It's concave up right here on that interval. So this is where that happens. And then it's going to be, uh, what did I say? Decreasing. So then it's decreasing when the derivative is negative, which is on this interval. So you're trying to figure out where did these two things overlap? If you can just see it, if you can see, okay, between negative and negative one third, it's negative. Uh, it's decreasing, and then from negative two thirds to infinity, it's concave up, then can you identify where it's overlapping, if at all? Does it overlap at all during there? So if you can, that's really good. For many students, they need to see it all put together on one chart. So that's okay if you need that. If you don't need it and you can do it, that's fine, but there'll be some times where you need to put it all together in one place. Now, when that happens, you basically have to take all of your critical points, which were these from our first derivative, and then your possible point of inflection, which was from that one. So we're gonna take all three of those. Uh, so what was that? I had a negative one, a negative two thirds for the possible point of inflection, and then a negative one third. So I'm just writing them down on the screen so I can see it again. So we're gonna take all three of these and create a chart with all of them. Okay, so I know this is a little bit tedious and we just did it, but do this with me again because that's part of the lesson. So we're gonna go from negative infinity up to negative one, and then we're gonna go negative one. I'm gonna write a little bit smaller because I know I have a lot to do here. And then I'm going to go from negative one up to negative two thirds, and then negative two thirds. And you can see what I'm doing now, hopefully. See, I'm just writing out all of these intervals and points. So negative two thirds up to negative one third. That's a really small interval. And then uh, what have I got next? Negative one third. And then from negative one third off to infinity. Okay, so what did we know from before? We knew from up above that the first derivative is zero at negative one and negative one third. So let's go ahead and do that. Negative one, it's first derivative is zero. Negative one third, the first derivative was zero. And then we also knew that the second derivative is zero at negative two thirds. So I can come back here at negative two thirds, the second derivative is zero. So now what we do is even though there's multiple uh, zones here, we have one, two, three different little things that we've got to write. Every single one of these has the same answer because the first derivative is only changing signs here and here. So what did we say about it? We said it went from positive to negative to positive. So we come back here, this one was the positive. In here it's negative. Okay, so it doesn't change signs anywhere in there. It has to be negative the whole time and then positive. And then the second derivative we said was negative and then positive. So we go 
the left side of negative two thirds is negative everywhere. And then the right side of negative two thirds was positive everywhere. So creating a chart with everything, it might look kind of tedious, but it's not that bad when you start off focusing on the zeros. When was the first derivative of zero? When is the second derivative of zero? Because then you just have the different, the two sides of those zeros to fill in. Okay, so now when is it concave up and decreasing? It's concave up when the second derivative is positive, which is here. It is concave, no, excuse me, it did concave up. It's decreasing when the first derivative is negative. So second derivative is positive, is concave up. First derivative negative decreasing, and then that overlaps right there. So the answer to this question is that happens on the interval negative two thirds to negative one third. That's when it happens. And that's the nice thing about having it all together in one place is you can very clearly see when it happens. But again, if you can see it here, you only need the two charts if you can verify it and you're not gonna make those mistakes of how does this overlap. Now let's have a quick review on speeding up or slowing down. You remember when we did this with the charts, velocity, positive graph, negative graph, all those things. So this speeding up happens if acceleration and velocity, so V of T and A of T, if velocity and acceleration have the same sign. And an object is slowing down if those two things have different signs. Because you wanna be really careful about your justification on this. I cannot believe how often I will see a student say that something is slowing down because the velocity is negative. That is that is absolutely not true. Velocity being negative does not mean it's slowing down. It's only slowing down if velocity is negative and you had a situation where the acceleration was positive. So they'd have to be different signs in order for it to slow down. All right, so now we don't have the graphs. We're just going to use our knowledge of calculus and what we just practiced to figure out is the particle speeding up or is it slowing down? So here's how we do this. We have a position function. Let's figure out the velocity function. Let's start off with that. So velocity function is going to be the derivative of this, which will be t squared minus 8t plus 12. And then the acceleration. Let's do the acceleration function is going to equal the derivative of this, which is 2t minus 8. All right, now uh, I better write small. I know I didn't give you tons of room. So set this equal to zero and solve, which means that we're gonna have to factor this. Uh, let's see, that's gonna be a t minus six and a t minus two. That'll factor that. And when does it equal zero? And then here we just set this thing equal to zero and start solving it. Um, okay, so over here we have t equals six and t equals two. And over here, we have t equals four. So instead of creating two separate charts, I'm going to create one big chart for this thing, but save yourself some room at the bottom of your chart in order to write out your answer for, and with your justification. Okay, so be careful about how big you make it. I'm gonna make mine big just on this lesson so you can see it. So I wanna say the t values, and then I want my, what's next? My velocity values, is it positive or negative? and then my acceleration values, and is it going to be positive or negative? Okay. So my first thing, let's start with my smallest number, it's two. So I'm going from negative infinity to two, and then at two, and then I'm going to go from two to, what's my next number, four. Four, because again, I'm not just using my critical points from the first derivative, I'm using also my possible candidates for points of inflection. And uh, so I just use it all. And then I have the value of four. And then I'm going from four to, what I say? Six is the next number, six. And then at the number six. And then we'll go from six to infinity. Okay. Oh, uh, I had a lot of extra room here. Okay, let's just get rid of that. And what next? The velocity is zero at these two numbers, two and six. So let's put a velocity is zero there. And there, so now that's nice. We only have to check a number in here and a number outside of there. Out the left side of two, the right side of six. And then the acceleration is zero at t equals four. So let's put a zero there. And now that's nice because I only have two sides of the zero to check. Okay, so let's try the left side of two. The left side of two, this is gonna be super negative, super negative, that's positive. A number in here, it could, I could choose any of the values in here, any, any of these intervals. So let's just use four. Four minus six is negative. That's positive, so this is gonna be negative. And if that one's negative, these have to be the same sign because it was zero here and zero there. And then on the far right side, go to positive infinity, that's gonna be positive. All right, now we do acceleration. 
Here's our acceleration piece right there, 2t minus 8. Super negative, minus 8. It's going to still be negative, so I have negative, negative, negative. It's the left side of this 0, acceleration of 0. And then the right side, these are all the same thing. Super positive number times 2, minus 8, that's going to be positive. So positive, positive, and positive. Okay, so now we can do our answers. When is it speeding up? Speeding up on what interval? So it's speeding up when we have the same sign. So that happens here, it's negative and negative. So we're going to say from 2 to 4. And, and I think we have another one, right? Yes, right here. The signs are the same. So and from 6 to infinity. Those are the two places it's speeding up. And now we say why? Because, because v of t and a of t have the same sign. That's why it's speeding up, because velocity and acceleration have the same sign on those intervals. All right, so then let's do slowing down. When is it slowing down? That happens on the intervals when the velocity and acceleration have different signs, which is right here. So we're going to start off this first one, negative infinity to 2. And then I think we have another one, right? Yes, right here. There's another one. Here the signs are different, so that also happens on 4 to 6. And then let's put a quick little justification. And it's that's true because v of t and a of t have different signs. Sorry, I ran out of room there. I'm squeezing that in. Sorry about that. Okay, so there's our justification. So just make sure you understand that when it's speeding up, slowing down, it's something we've already done before, but now we're just using all of our analysis with these charts to help us come up with our conclusions. Again, the chart is not your, your justification. This quick little statement down here, those are your justifications. The chart just helps you organize it and find the answer. Last part of our lesson is actually fairly easy, and that is when we have a table of values, x's and, and y's, so we just have f of x, can we figure out if the function is increasing or decreasing? Well, that's only if we know some specific things, okay? Because we only have values at these selected points. If we know that the first derivative and second derivative do not change signs, so it's not going to go increasing and decreasing, it's not going to be concave up or concave down, it's one or the other, then we can figure this out. So if we start a y value of 1, and then 2, and then 4, and then 7, okay, that's easy. The numbers are getting bigger, so it's increasing. Duh. Increasing. Easy. Oh, I should say, if we know it's increasing, it might, we don't, we know for sure it's not dipping below 1 because f prime is the same sign. Okay, it doesn't change it. So if it's going from 1 to 2 here, it had to be going up the whole way. Okay, I should have mentioned that again. All right, so then concave up or concave down. Well, that has to do with the second derivative. So let's take a look at this. What's the average rate of change between 1 and 2? It's 1. What's the average rate of change between 2 and 4? That is 2. What's the average rate of change between 4 and 7? Now, I should be look, pointing out that my x's are all increasing by 1. So that's what makes this a little bit easier. So that is 3. So this represents like my f prime, my average f prime, I should say. This is the average. So how, what is happening here? This is going up, up, up. It's going, it's increasing. If f prime is increasing, right? So think about this. We've been, we've been talking about this. If f prime is increasing, by definition, that means its derivative must be positive. So if f prime is getting bigger, we know the second derivative is positive, therefore it is concave up. Okay, important way to connect f prime and f double prime just from a table of values, you can be able to figure that stuff out. Again, it has to have the caveat that f prime and f double prime are not changing signs because we don't know for sure what's happening in between these points, but we do know that the signs are not changing. Okay, that's everything. We covered it all for this one. Uh, finally got through all that crazy curve sketching for Rock That Mastery Check. And in the next lesson, we're going to get into optimization. <laughs>